In this lecture, we're going to be talking about hunting on a system using Yara. Um, so those of you who uh, watched last week's lecture uh, and uh, followed the material that was posted on March 10th, um, you know, I worked off of the Yara rules that were built before uh, for the Alice in Wonderland case, um, and then used some of those concepts to build uh, string signatures and then use the analysis that we did in Ghidra uh, later on to generate a signature trying to identify uh, significant code, so um, actual assembly language or compiled assembly language uh, inside the program's binary. And at the end of the exercise, we found a signature that looked more or less like this. So this XOR string function, uh, which is a combination of, um, of blocks um, that we're looking for in the program. After we put this together, we looked at how frequent each one of these strings were. And you can see this information here. And we decided to use that uh, to build a much more um, a much more complex condition uh, out of the rule that might be able to help us identify cases where a slightly different version of the program uh, was compiled and delivered onto a system. So in this uh, lecture, we're going to look at how to take the, a signature like this and use Yara to actually investigate a uh, suspected system. So a system that's suspected to be compromised. So what I will do is I'll take the rule material here. So I'm going to take this and copy it. Now remember we have a different condition down there so I'm going to edit this after I uh, put it into the system. But um, we're going to put this in a, a Yara example. Actually I'm going to um, put it into a folder that's accessible by the Windows VM. So I'm going to put it into a folder that's accessible via the Windows VM. So we'll just call this, you know, video rule one dot yar. I'm going to paste the rule in here. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to grab that condition that I have right here, and I'm going to use this one instead of the original condition. So this is what we put all of our work into coming up with, so this is what we're going to use. So one thing to keep in mind is that there are two components that are needed uh, on the system. One is this um, uh, copy of Yara. So this is the binaries for Yara, the 32-bit binaries since we're using a 32-bit Windows. Um, these are actually accessible on um, Yara's uh, GitHub site. So you can see at the bottom the URL there. There's a 64-bit version if you need a 64-bit version. Uh, and in order to run this, because it was built with Visual Studio 14, I need to also install this uh, Visual Studio redistributable. Uh, so I've already downloaded this, um, but if you have not and you haven't installed it in your Windows machine, uh, go ahead and do that now. Uh, I'm actually going to jump over to my Windows machine. I've already got it staged in place, so I'm going to install that bundle first. So it's right here. And you can see the rule is right here as well. All right, so that's installed. Um, it should take uh, maybe two to five minutes to install. Uh, once it's complete, you'll get to this. So I have skipped uh, waiting on the install step because you don't need to wait for that, um, at least not in the video. Uh, so that is uh, 
taken care of. And then the other thing was um, I unzipped the contents of the zip file uh, and they're right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab both of I'm going to grab both of these. Um, I'm going to copy them because so I'm, I'm going to install them somewhere here. But what I want to do so for me, I find it's easiest just to make a new folder, um, call it Yara tool or something like that. I think I just called it tools on the uh, on the lecture notes that I've got on the left hand side here. And then I paste them in there. So I basically copied it in there. In addition to that, I'm going to go and I'm going to grab this rule that I just copied as well. Or not that one, this one. I'm going to grab this rule that I just copied as well. And I'm going to put that in here too. So now I've got all three of those components in here. So now I'm going to run cmd.exe and I'm going to go into the Yara tool directory and just to make sure that it's working I want to make sure that the Visual Studio bundle got installed I'll run this. So if I get output like this that means it's running uh, and everything's installed fine. If I had a dialog box pop up that told me it was missing a DLL uh, then that would be bad and that probably means that um, you need to reinstall the Visual Studio bundle. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to do this to show me um, the options that Yara has. So as you can see there's a lot of different options here. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them uh, in detail. Um, as we've run Yara before in, in Linux, the interface is the same, but you know, the big ones here, print the strings um, is useful and printing the metadata is useful for displaying those things. Um, so modifying the output so you get the output that you want. The other important thing that we're probably going to use here is going to be recursive, um, which is recursively search directories. Um, so we're going to use that. Um, and what we're going to do, um, so this is a fresh VM. I have not, in, I have not compromised it with the malicious tool yet. Uh, I'm going to reuse the malware.exe that was issued with your midterm project, um, because that's what we used for building the signature in that earlier lecture. Um, so the way that this works um, is relatively straightforward. So I'll just use dash R. Um, for recursive, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it the YAR rule, excuse me, the video rule, and then I'm going to say C colon to have it recursively scan the contents of the C directory, right? So one thing that you will notice uh, soon if you uh, let this run for a little while is you'll start to see these uh, little error messages like this pop up. There's a lot of files that Windows has that, and there you go, there's a large number of them. There's large files that Windows has, the large number of files that Windows has uh, that are uh, syst either system files or they're locked um, for, re uh, for opening. Um, possibly because another process has an exclusive lock on them, etc. Um, so in a more advanced situation, what I might do is I might actually want to capture all these um, so that I could try and determine in the future if, uh, say, um, some newly locked file uh, exists on a system, right? So when I you know, get rid of the common ones, like these are the registry files here, um, the ones that are going to be locked. Um, but uh, for the exercise that we're doing today, um, it's just important to realize that uh, you'll get a lot of messages like this. It doesn't mean the program is um, breaking or you did something wrong. Um, it's really just being noisy about letting you know that there were some files that it couldn't scan. What, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to control C it. Uh, so I'm going to kill the process. Um, Windows has the ability for me to 
redirect all of that to null so I can do this. Uh, what this will do is it will hide all the error messages, but uh, if Yara itself generates any informational messages like um, anything telling me that it has found a match, it'll actually print those to the screen. So this is a good way of just remember the two greater than to null will um, redirect all of the error messages um, to the null device, which basically discards them. A uh, very similar syntax uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Unix and Linux, um, but it's just easy to keep in mind. So you can see I've run this for a little while. Uh, I'm getting no output. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to control C that. Um, the next thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to run the malware on here. So I'm going to actually install the malware. Uh, now you'll notice that I'm not really setting up the controller at all. Um, because I don't really need the controller um, executing on the Kelly machine in order for this exercise to work. So really, um, when you're dealing with malware in the in the real world, you're going to have a lot of cases where malware doesn't rely or doesn't have to rely upon network connectivity in order to be running in the background. Uh, the goal for it is to be running and to constantly be checking. Um, for connectivity, and then when there is connectivity, it's going to connect out. Uh, so um, that said, uh, while there's no connectivity, like while you haven't connected to Wi-Fi or something like that, um, then the malware will still be running and the code's still living in memory, uh, waiting for that connection to appear. So that's a situation that we're going to simulate. We're going to say, for instance, that uh, you have a suspect machine here, uh, one that someone said was acting weird, you've unplugged it from the network, right? So it can't talk to the internet, can't talk to any of the machines. The malware is probably running in the background. So, um, you know, the malware sample that I'm looking for, I actually found on another machine that I confirmed was bad. So maybe this is one of two machines, or this is another one of two machines that the same user is using. And so you figure that, um, okay, this person had malware on one machine, chances are they're doing very similar things on their other computer, uh, say their desktop or their laptop. Um, I want to verify, or I want to try and find the malware that I found on their first system. I want to see if it is also on their second system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this again. And we'll see if it manages to uh, to identify a copy of the malware on the system. And look, uh, there we go. You can already see that um, the copy of the malware that I put on the desktop, um, that copy is still there. Uh, and then also the copy of the malware that it installs into the public libraries folder uh, is also still there. Um, so that you know, that's the copy of the malware that's going to be running on the system when it reboots, right? So um, that's how we hunt for it on the file system of the system of the computer, right? So uh, we found copies of it on the hard drive here. Um, that doesn't necessarily tell us that the malware was running, but it does tell us that the malware was uh, running at one point in time. So what I might do then is go and navigate to this um, public folder here. So public. And a lot of times you won't be able to see this um, right away. Uh, what you'll have to do is you'll actually have to hit Alt and then do folder options, so tools, folder options. Then in here, you're going to choose to show the hidden files, right? And now I can see the libraries folder is here. So this is one of the other reasons why uh, the malware is configured to write to that specific directory, because on a normal user system, that whole directory is going to be hidden from the user's view. So the user is going to be somewhat, you know, possibly mystified as to where the file's running if they do happen to see it running. Um, if and um, 
you know, if they even encounter it at all, right? So that's a folder that is normally not apparent uh, as existing on the system to the user who's only living within this UI. So there, we found it, and I can even say take a copy of this if I wanted to, and copy it into here, right? So there we go. Now we have a, collected a copy of it, right? Uh, so also, um, I'd be able to, say, analyze this one too and determine if it's different. So the other thing that we have going on on the system is we have the malware running. And, um, you know, say, for instance, that we couldn't find the malware on the hard drive like this, right? Um, for some reason, maybe it has some sort of special encryption on disk or something like that. We wouldn't be able to find the malware on the system on this particular copy. So in this event, um, one of the nice things, and I'll go back to Yara's help uh, in order to show you this. One of the nice features is that Yara supports a process ID. So instead of just scanning files, I can scan uh, processes memory um, you know, while the program's running. So, you know, there's a lot of um, tools that you can uh, use for this. So, for instance, I can look at Task Manager. So, view running processes with Task Manager. So, if I go over here, I can look at all the different processes. Uh, one of the challenging things about this is that, um, as you can see, it's um, not very easy to get the process ID number out of this view. Um, so, trying to see, yeah, so if I go up here to view and select columns, I can click on process ID and now I get to see it, um, but it's not very apparent. The other thing that I often use is task list, right? So task list.exe is right here and it shows me all the processes here. So for instance, I can see the malware.exe processes right here, right? And it is process ID number 2996. So if I wanted to, I could do 2996. So notice that instead of giving it a file name, I'm giving it a number. Um, and I can also take away, whoops, I can also take away this R because I can't recursively scan memory. So uh, so we're not even going to try and recursively scan memory. 2996. So now you can see that uh, it identifies it, right? So So what happens if I give it say 596, this audio DG. Yep. I can't detach that process for whatever reason. It says that I should try running it as root. So maybe I can do this. And I can run this as administrator, right? So let's try this again. Yara32. And then we'll do five, what was it? Five, nine, six. Five, nine, six. Nope, oh, I still can't do it. So we'll do 568 and look at this con host. Or we'll look at this, say, Explorer 1620, right? So now it's, scan it's scanning all of Explorer's memory. And it doesn't come up with anything, but it still comes up with it if I try this again. So when Yara is reporting uh, matching, uh, code within uh, one of these things. Um, what it'll do is it'll show you just the process ID number uh, where the file name usually is. So I'm going to also have it display the strings so you can see 
that in fact, you know, we're matching the same set of strings that we were matching before. So that format should look pretty for, uh, familiar to you um, uh, from the last lecture. So uh, this becomes difficult because as you can see that I have a, you know, task list has, you know, I don't know how many processes are here, but there's a lot of them and I don't want to have to walk through every single one of them. Not every program installs itself and runs, runs itself under the name malware.exe. Uh, so that could be a pretty lengthy hunting game. So one of the tricks that you can do with a Windows command line is you can use a for loop like this. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to bring the contents of this for loop into the uh, virtual machine here. So see, you can see it's here. Um, just recognize that in the lecture notes, I use a slightly different, um, slightly different Yara signature name. So I need to make sure that I use the correct one here, put my placeholder variable there, and then do this, right? So I want to suppress those error messages from being output. Like for instance, the one that tells me that it was unable to scan a particular process ID. So uh, for loops like this are really easy or are, are really helpful uh, for trying to do batch runs of the same command over a long list of items. Uh, so I recommend uh, doing some uh, research on this command and some of the other ones, um, which can really help speed up uh, repetitive tasks. I describe here in the uh, lecture notes uh, what's going on with that. So um, I'm not going to go into it in the video, but feel free to go and uh, read up on this on your own. So let me get back to the video. <clears throat> and now I'm going to run it. And what it's going to do is it's actually going to step through each line of the task list. And then no header or NH means that I remove this header up here. Um, and then it's going to run the command on each one of these numbers here. So it's going to run this command down here under each one of these numbers. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that I put this little at sign in front um, because in Windows uh, it will print the command each time it runs it unless you put the at sign in front and in that case it won't tell you what command it's running before it runs it. Um, so as you can see it completed and it went through every single one of these and the only one that it matched on was number 2996. So if I was someone who was trying to um, he was trying to uh, analyze all this um, and look for the malicious process on a system. I could de I could detect that, and I might have a long library of YAR rules, which are looking for a lot of different malware samples I've learned about. And then I might use a tool like, um, you know, we'll go back here to um, back in January when we were doing static analysis of compromised VM. I might end up using a tool like you know, win pmem um, to pull uh, the process memory for that particular process. Um, there's a number of other tools as well that uh, you can use to do that. And then finally, in the whole process of my um, program cleanup, you know, I might have to you know, go back to task manager and I might actually go here, you know, using the process ID and end the process. And see, you can see I can even create a dump file here if I want to. So there we go. So I actually got a copy of the dump file just using the Windows tools. Um, and then I can end the process here. So, and then that got put in the temp directory, right? So, Just do this again to double check where the folder was. So, yeah, app data local temp, right? 
So if I wanted to, I could go back to Yara here and I could paste this and it was called malware.dump. So I can actually run the Yara rule, the exact same Yara rule against the dump file. So I've done a very simple memory capture of a suspicious process um, using just the built-in Windows tools, which was really, uh, really helpful for me. Um, so this also gives us a verification that, hey, Yara is doing uh, what we wanted it to do. Mm. So, you know, that's uh, a handful of very simple, basic ways to use Yara for doing uh, system analysis. So trying to detect malware in the system. Uh, I will say that in the field, uh, when you're doing this for work, you'll probably use much more sophisticated tools for uh, each one of these exercises. Um, but in this case, I feel it's uh, really helpful to show the low-level details of what's going on. So actually using the R tool itself and using the uh, you know, directly with the R rules that you built. Um, you know, in the field, again, uh, you may have a number of tools out there um, that you're using to run Yara on your behalf or that have Yara integrated into them and uh, do all sorts of advanced features.